morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Welcome to this week's Come Follow Me lesson with the Mormon News Report podcast. My name is Jenny Noonan Dai. I am joining you from Salt Lake City, Utah. And joining me, I have my co host and friend in Detroit, Michigan, Brant Malone. Good morning, Brant. Good morning, Jenny. I am I am freshly shorn. Uh, it was one of those days where I said, you know what, let's get rid of the beer. Let's give myself a haircut. A, a freshly shorn Brant, to, to steal a phrase from Austin Powers, a freshly shorn Brant is a sight to behold. And I hope that's the case for everyone watching us on, on, uh, on our virtual stream today. I mean, could we look more different, you and me, with the way our hair is and is not? It, it, it's, isn't that the truth? There is so much truth there, Jenny. Yes. Also joining us today, of course, as ever, my illustrious husband, John Dye. Good morning, everyone. John Happy Dye. Father's Day. Yeah. Happy Father's Day. John uh, is the one who sets up all our streaming, everything. He makes this possible with the video, with the slides that you'll see, any quotes, uh, any screen sharing of any kind. That's his That's his deal. And that's what he does. And he does it well. So thank you very much for that. The man behind the curtain, John Dye. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And as John mentioned, happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to everybody. Uh, John, happy Father's Day to you. And, and I hope it was a, a, a good Father's Day morning. I know for me, my, my girls were very excited to, uh, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I'm getting soft in my old age, Jenny, but, but homemade cards from all the kids, especially my four-year-old who, you, who you've met, she's just this little ball of energy. She drew something and then was so excited to give it to me and wanted to point out everything. My six-year-old, who's the sweetest little girl, wrote this little poem and she wanted to read it to me. So it's, I'm, I'm getting this Father's Day, like I'm becoming a softie as I get older and, and really starting to be like, oh, I like this. We could do this more often now. Beautiful. I love it. Uh, do you, are you sentimental? Do you hold on to those things? Um, I mean, we hold on to them. I, I think it's, it's great to hold on to because it would be fun as they get older to say, Hey, do you remember when you were six to, to look at this? Um, but I think Ashley's probably a little more sentimental than, than I am when it comes to some of those things. I, I like to hold on to it though, because they're unique little things that when you look back later on, it's like, Oh, look at this. Isn't maybe, I don't know. Maybe that is sentimentality. I don't know. I don't know what I am anymore, Jenny. <laughs> I think it is. And, and I will say from personal experience, it's very rewarding to come across those treasures, those homemade gifts and things, cards, notes, poems, letters, uh, later on down the road when your kids are doing things like on being on missions yeah. and married and things. So uh, welcome everyone. When they've got lives of their own and they're not focused on like, hey, my, my life is within the four walls of my house. Yes, and, and it's like, oh, will I ever get another I love you so much mommy card? Maybe not. Exactly. Maybe not. So yeah, happy Father's Day. Um, thanks to everyone who's checking in already. Um, the regulars who usually join us, anyone new, thank you for being here. And please do, um, as Bessie has done here, viewing from Oklahoma, and Amber, and Mesa, and Wendy, thank you. Let us know where you're watching from. And also, we'd love to know, um, of course, as always, what, if anything, stood out to you uh, in this lesson this week. The, the lesson, our study for this, this week, and today is Sunday, um, June 21st, 2020. The lesson for the week, we studied Alma, chapters 13 through 16. The name of the lesson is, Enter into the Rest of the Lord. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and start. Brant, um, do you have any... Any uh, just kind of overall general thoughts from from this week's lesson? I do. I think that we could take a couple things away from this week's lesson. Uh, I think that Alma did a lot of preaching in there, and there's a lot of substantive information in there, specifically about the priesthood, the nature of repentance, the nature of, of people being called by God. But then there's also this some interesting things that go along when we look at the the Book of Mormon as a as a piece of literature. This idea of uh, potentially parallel narratives that are happening, and we'll probably get into this a little bit later, comparing and contrasting two similar mission experiences. And I know that we're, we're very focused on a, a small section of the scriptures, but maybe a little bit later on, I want to expand that a little bit, and, and it might get into next week's lesson. 
but just to really look at what is actually going on here because there's it the benefit of of shrinking down what we're talking about to a few chapters means we really hyper focus on that the downside though is sometimes you get so hyper focused that you don't see the entire narrative of what's happening and how that really applies to everything that's going on within the scriptures and and really the world around them so maybe we'll get into that in a little bit yeah no kidding no kidding um wow that that was quite a lot thank you for that um you know i noticed and i this is just out of curiosity um you tweeted something this morning, and I'm wondering if it had to do with this lesson. If it did, I'd like to talk about it. If it didn't, we don't have to because, you know, but I just, I want to, as comfortably as, as comfortable as you are with this, um, can you talk about that at all? Sure. Yeah. So we were doing, we were doing our home church and, and usually what I'll do is I'll grab the, the primary manual that you use for come follow me. We'll pull out a couple of paragraphs and try and talk about it with our kids. Um, my four-year-old, we're just hoping that she can pull a few things out of there. My six-year-old is starting to get to a point where she really likes to engage and talk more about these, these concepts and topics. And we were talking a little bit about the priesthood and trying to give a, a general baseline. Um, my my six-year-old, so on Sundays, my, my kids watch, a, especially with coronavirus lockdown, my kids watch a lot of TV. And so on Sundays, what we've made the rule is we could watch a few different types of shows. We could watch anything that's church related, even on, on YouTube, it's gotta be church related, or we can watch uh, like animal or, or nature shows like National Geographic and things like that. So more calm, calming things. Yeah, uh, and yeah, things that aren't gonna be very, uh, um, that aren't gonna, I, I don't know how to describe it, be too silly or, or you know, just try and do something different for a Sunday. So my daughter had watched something on the, I, I think it's a YouTube channel called Latter-day Kids. Have you heard of that? Latter-day Kids. Um, I don't know if we've watched that know. one. So they, well, they do. I'm not sure if it's officially, if it's officially by the church or if it's by another group. But they do, uh, um, you know, little stories and animations and things like that. Anyway, she had watched one this morning about the priesthood, and it just coincided with what we were talking about with our home church, and we decided to talk a little bit about the priesthood in general, what it means. And it was interesting because we we get through a lot of the basics on the priesthood. We get through things like this is this is what it means, and this is what we can do with the priesthood. <clears throat> and towards the end of it, my my little six year old is sitting on my lap, and she said something along the lines of, "So do girls get the priesthood?" And I said, "No, that that hasn't happened." And she looks at me and goes, "Well, that's weird." <laughs> I was just like, "Yep, that's that's." pretty much all you can say. And, and I've heard of a lot of people having these conversations with their children, especially if there are, if there are girls and, and me in a situation where I've got all three of my children are girls. I have a feeling that that's going to be a conversation that, that continues to happen. And it, it's always interesting. I knew that question was going to come up at some point. And all you can think of to say is just, no, it, it hasn't happened yet. And I wasn't going to get into why or some of the history behind it or anything like that because she's six but it's it's i guess it was just okay let's, let's put this here let, let's put the baseline down here and then maybe later on we could have more discussions about it sure well thank you for sharing that and i'll just say as a mom who i had three daughters and and i have following those three daughters i have a son and it was my son who first won one Sunday when he was very young, leaned over to me in church and said, why are just boys passing the sacrament? So it's, I mean, it's a conversation to get ready to have, but I, I guess I would point out that as I read specifically Alma chapter 13, I did not see anything about that part of the priesthood. Mm. As far as, as men only or, or just the priesthood in general or? As far as men only. I mean, it in um, it says in Alma chapter 13, verse 2, and those priests were ordained after the order of his son in a manner that thereby the people might know in what manner to look forward to his son for redemption. Hmm. So the focus is more on that the priesthood is in the order of and the manner of the savior, the focus is on Jesus Christ. 
And while we don't specifically read priests as opposed to or in conjunction with priestesses in this chapter that I noticed, and I could be wrong, I maybe missed something, but that was kind of my impression um, that the focus is on the savior and, um, and the power of the priesthood and the ordinances as opposed to that uh, current that we sometimes notice the, the gender divide. And we've talked about this before about, about um, ordination in temples and things too. So anyway. Well, I mean, just, just really quickly, I, I think that the fact that we're having this conversation now in, in 2020, and the fact that this conversation has been happening since when, 20, well, it's been happening more and more frequently since about 2012 when more, the ordained women- More publicly. More, yeah, that's a better way to phrase it. Because it's, it's been happening for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say going back to the the, uh, the second wave feminism that Mormonism experienced back in what, the 60s and 70s when it was being talked about more. But I think that maybe that word is the key word there. It's being talked about more publicly. And I think the benefit of it being talked about more publicly is it's it's funneling up towards the top leadership more and it's being discussed in in various avenues like like general conference talks and other areas where we're at least hearing more information. Now, I'm not going to say that the information is is necessarily what people want to hear or not, but the fact that we're getting general conference talks that really get deep into the priesthood and specifically what the women have with regards to access to the priesthood, because Oaks has talked about that a bit, and I think Nelson has talked about that as well. Oaks is the one that stands out to me. That wouldn't have happened 20 years ago because it would have been considered a little bit heretical to even consider the fact of, of a woman utilizing the priesthood and talking about that in such a public way. So it's really interesting to see how the, the discussion has evolved. And what I'd like to see is I'd like to see the discussion happening more and more because by having the discussion and hearing the perspectives and, and kind of, well, going back to, to something that I know you're very fond about, if you look at what was happening in, in the musical Hamilton and what was happening in, in the United States at that time, they were really hashing out the idea of government. And so you have, have some, having someone like Hamilton and Burr and, and Hamilton and Jefferson, like those were really important discussions that you have to have publicly and you have to sometimes have some contentious back and forth. And it's the same thing with regards to this. And so for me, I'm hopeful, and I think we've seen a lot of progress and there's a lot more progress that potentially could come. And so I'm hopeful for those days, especially when I look at my my daughters uh, and, and hopefully being able to have better answers than I don't know, it hasn't happened. Right. Um, thank you, Brent. I, I would also say, yes, I, I do recognize, um, I think we all can, that there have been several uh, talks um, and articles specifically in the past few years talking about um, women and their, uh, whether it's their access to priesthood power or their, um, the blessings of, you know, women, uh, the, the blessings that women experience through through the priesthood. I, I would just, um, I and I don't know that, that those talks are more frequent now than before. I can't speak to that because I don't, I don't have a, a knowledge of, you know, the history of conference talks and things. Uh, but I would just say that I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that um, for many people, it is, it is not about, as far as women being or, ordained to the priesthood. It's not about what we have access to, but what we can give. I know there are many women who are in positions of, you know, where they are single moms and would like very much to be able to do things like give their kids blessings and such. So well, that's and, a and, and, for maybe another whole hour. Well, and, and just really quickly, Jenny, going along with that, I think that it, it is in stark contrast and it really comes to light during situations that we have now. Um, Michigan just announced, at least our state just announced, we still have no plans to go back to church. The only thing that they've opened up church-wise for us is for the sacrament now to be allowed to be administered to those who cannot uh, bless the sacrament themselves or for whatever reason. So that's that's big for us opening up. But think about those three months that that didn't happen and, and the access that the priesthood might have had that would have changed that. Now, that being said, I wonder if a way to think about it the way that we're talking about it now is priesthood for a long time used to be very gendered. It was 
told to males and always about males. And at least now it's almost like it shifted to say it, it should not be thought of as a male or a female thing. It is just this power that's out there that just so happens to go to males, but women have access. And it's this weird uh, uh, uncertainty area that I think we're all trying to figure out right now. For sure. And, and uh, in that vein, I would also say that, um, you know, it's, well, we've been told to not refer to the men as the priesthood. It's not the priesthood and the women. Yep. So, um, so I'm, I want to, um, I want to head over to a comment here from Ben Bernards, who's joining us from Northern California. Um, when I, I mentioned before that in Alma chapter 13, when I was reading it, I didn't see any sort of gendered assignation to, uh, to what the priesthood uh, meant or means in that. Um, and so he says, totally agreed. According to this text, the qualifiers to receiving the priesthood was having faith and good works, having chosen good and exercising faith. It doesn't say anything about gender or age or other qualifiers. Not that they couldn't have been there, maybe they were, but it's helpful for us to remember what serving God should be about. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, exercising faith, showing faith, uh, living through faith, um, that's something that's, that's very helpful. And uh, there was a phrase that I really wanted to find. I should have highlighted it, and I didn't. So um, really quickly, Jenny, I, and I know that we need to move on from this idea yeah. of women in the priesthood, but it's I, I always like having this discussion because there's a lot of viewpoints out there. And, and Barbara points out a viewpoint that that I've actually heard from from my wife. And, and she says, I don't want any more power. We have enough on our plates as women. And that's one of the things that my wife has talked about, that that she does not feel like she wants to advocate for for more and not because she doesn't. Uh, want to have access to it to be able to bless her her children more, but it's more. I, I've got enough on my plate. I can't begin to think about one more thing, and so there's a lot of different attitudes, e even among women. And and I, I I don't as a man, I don't mean to be speaking for all women. I'm just talking about the the anecdotal experiences of people that I've been around. Some are are passionate about. I would like to utilize this for my family, for myself, uh, to be able to to minister and and comfort those that I can I can assist. And others saying, "That's I got enough. I'm worrying about here." So there's a lot of different viewpoints. Yes, and thank you, Barbara, for saying that. Um, I know Barbara. I love Barbara. She's a good friend. Um, I've heard a lot of friends say that, and Ashley too. Your good wife. Um, and I, I, I just go back to again. It, it's not a, about what. Yeah, about getting power, about getting more, but but about what I, what we can, can give because, mm -hmm. you know, as is often brought up, um, the priesthood is used as some, something to bless others' lives. And I, I think I will forever go back to that time in my life when I was a single mom and, um, and had some experiences where, um, what I wanted more than anything was to be able to give my, my kids a blessing of comfort sometimes during the day, um, other times in the middle of the night. And um, anyhow. And well, and Jenny, going along with that, a situation that that I think that it would be difficult for men to understand, but a woman going through something like a, a miscarriage or a very difficult pregnancy, wouldn't it be great for a woman with that priesthood access to be able to minister and comfort another woman by, yes. by giving them a, a very personal and, and spiritually guided blessing as they're going through that. Something that I think that men might, might conceptually in, in almost a, a theoretical way understand, but the practicality of what that means would not be able to understand that. I know that we've talked in the past that uh, we've had some difficulties with, with miscarriages in the past. And it's always been striking to me that when my wife has talked about it with friends who have had that same thing, that there seems to be this outpouring of affection because that's something that only women will truly understand what that means to have life inside of you and then life not to be there. Agreed there. I mean, um, uh, gender is, is eternal and there are specific experiences to each, uh, gender and, and 
carrying life, being pregnant is is something that. Uh, yeah, you're right. I agree with you. That's that's good. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna share one thing. You know, and regardless of where you know where you fall on this, I I think um, you know the church obviously is as times begin to change, you need to, you know, you need to, to definitely look into this. And President Monson, you know, regardless of gender, I think this is key to chapter 13 when it talks about the priesthood. And we look at chapter 14 where it talks about the order of the knee whores and you just, you know, do a comparison contrast. And chapter 13, you know, this, this quote, I think, epitomizes that. With the priesthood, you gaze upward, you look inward, you reach outward and you press forward. You know, he was great at giving us these sound bites. Um, the prophet was prophet. Uh, well, President Thomas S. Monson, and and I think that's important as we as we think through this. And as again, we compare and contrast chapters thirteen verses fourteen. You know, the order of the knee whores was what can you do for me? Right. We're talking about, um, uh, and and we'll learn later that the, if people didn't agree with them, they actually got rid of them literally. Um, but with the priesthood, it's all about service. It's all about looking outward. It's all about gazing upward, trying to do better. And regardless of gender, that's got to be the bottom line. And uh, I think we all would agree with that, right? Yes. And that was also called John Dye wanting to move on. Um, but, but John, <laughs> could you could you pull up that, that graphic one more time? Sure. Um, a question for, for you and Jenny, and I guess anyone that's watching, is there anything out of this couplet that stands out to you? Because gaze upward, look inward, reach outward, and press forward. Um, I don't know about you, but the phrase reach outward really jumped out to me. And I think it's because of what we're going through right now with, with many of us in locations that are that are still grappling with coronavirus and not being able to do the reach outward aspect of things. Um, but I think that it also stands out because sometimes that's the hardest part to reach out. It's gazing upward and looking inward and pressing forward are individual things that we can do. But the reaching outward part is tough because that means you need to put yourself out there and engage with somebody else. And I think that that's another powerful thing because sometimes, sometimes that could be a bit scary. Sometimes that could be a bit nerve wracking to be like, okay, I'm putting myself out here. Are we going to work together on this? Are you going to be cool with me doing this? So that was the one that stood out to me was reach outward. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Especially given our current situation and all the things we're going through, it's, it's, and becoming vulnerable, right? That's a little tough too, as you think through, as you serve others, you are a bit vulnerable, right? You could be turned away. You could be shunned. You could be, um, you know, cast aside per se, but looking Looking out inward is important to me as well, I think, as you do that introspection, but reaching outward to others and serving and figuring out ways that you can make a difference in their life, for sure, especially now. That is a perfect tie. Thank you, both of you. That is a perfect tie-in to, um, you know, the, and, and again, I'll go back to what I said before, which is in Albert chapter 13, verse 2, or is it verse 2? Nope. Okay, never mind. Um, but just how how what we learn about? Um, oh yeah, in verse two, uh, ordained after the order of his son, in a manner that thereby the people might know in what manner to look forward to his son for redemption. That that what we're talking about here is not. I don't want to get into a. a, a this isn't a, a conversation about ordaining women or not. Um, it just the the power of the priesthood is centered in Jesus Christ and. And um, and acting with authority to perform ordinances uh, in His name, uh, priesthood ordinances help God's children receive redemption through Jesus Christ. And um, and in that graphic that you shared, John, and what you were talking about, Brant, what stood out to you about reaching outward? One thing that really stood out to me as I was studying this week is. In Alma chapter 13 and verse 10, if we can go there, it said, it says, now, as I said, concerning the holy order or this high priesthood, there were many who were, who were ordained and became high priests of God. And it was on account of their exceeding faith and repentance and their righteousness before God, they choosing to repent and work righteousness rather than to perish. And, and the phrase work righteousness is what stood out to me. Because often we 
what we talk about is uh, the, you know, are the steps of recognition, humility, choosing to change, repentance, and going forward. But this working righteousness, choosing to repent and work righteousness rather than to perish. And I think that's exactly what you two were just talking about in reaching outward and reaching uh, outward. And that is not something that anyone needs to be ordained to any office of the priesthood in order to do, to work righteousness. And I would I would even say that that doing so is that very thing, is acting as the Savior would act. Well, and, and it goes back to one of the phrases that uh, Elder David Bednar brings up a lot, acting and not being acted upon. I think that it's it's very easy for us, if we go back to the original quote that John brought up from, from President Monson, but also this section of the scripture in verse 10 here, it's very easy for us to focus on ourselves, but I don't think that that's the whole point of going through life, making sure that you yourself are good. I think it's this second step that we need to take as far as working righteousness. Working righteousness to me is a very active process. It is not just you focused on you, but it's it's you focused on the world around you. And if you think of working righteousness, that's not just being righteous. To me, being righteous is a very uh, isolated and, and almost stagnant process. Working righteousness makes it sound like A, there's something active you're doing, but B, you got to roll up your sleeves and work at it. It's not just going to come easy. And I think that that could be intimidating to some, but it should also be, I don't want to call it exhilarating, but it should also be something that we're looking forward to. Going to the gym and lifting weights or running, that is an active process. And some people loathe it, but some people, when they really understand what's happening, they begin to love it because you're pushing yourself more. It allows your body to extend and use this great energy that you have. And maybe that's the same thing, working righteousness. its They're like muscles we got to work, and we're supposed to work those muscles because that's why we're here. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that uh, that when, you know, that doing, you, you talked about being righteous we're you know we're in the scriptures is, it says work righteousness um i would say that it's the work that in any capacity the work that leads us to the being right you mentioned the gym there's working toward what being fit and being fit but but you have to work for it so mm -hmm. yeah that absolutely um i want to talk about something that in um in in chapter 13, verse 16, it says, Now these ordinances were given after this manner, that thereby the people might look forward on the Son of God, it being a type of his order, or it being his order, and this, that they might look forward to him for a remission of their sins, that they might enter into the rest of the Lord. What is the rest of the Lord? Ooh. Um, you know, I'm reminded of this... Of this uh... I hope I get it correctly. Um, I want to say it was a dream that Brigham Young had where he saw Joseph Smith. And the context of this dream was Joseph Smith was was working. And I want to say that, and, and I might have this completely wrong, but I want to say that that entering into the rest of the, of the Lord um, was this idea that you work really, really hard here so that you could enter into the rest of the Lord and finally have the chance to to rest because going through the work that we're doing here is exhausting i don't know if the quote's 100 percent correct because i'm also reminded in the back of my mind of like joseph talking about him how he's busier on the other side of the veil than he is on this one but that idea of the rest of the lord it just sounds it sounds like a nice blanket i see my i see my one-year-old go down for her afternoon nap and she's got her blanket with her and she looks so calm and peaceful and that's what i imagine the rest of the lord to be this idea of well, like a one-year-old going down for a nap, and 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 Christ putting you in your little in your in your little crib, so you can just have this nice <laughs> rest with your comfort blanket. Yeah. But let me let me throw in a thought. So that's one meaning of the word rest. Uh, another is the remainder of the Lord, right? The rest of the Lord. Um, meaning, we know we to to be perfect. We often hear you can't become perfect in this life. Meaning, just like Christ, you can become whole. As we talk about perfection, but um, sorry, I'll actually show my face here. I'm not a disembodied voice, but the the rest of the Lord, meaning there's only certain things I believe that we can do and we can accomplish on this earth. 
as we think through what the rest of the Lord is, uh, if we can say, uh, well done, thou good and faithful servant, during this life, then we're able to enter into the rest of the Lord and do more things moving forward. So, yeah. So, an interesting. I, I'm just I'm just looking at at some of the other parts of the verses. If you go to verse 13, that that concept of rest is there as well. And now, my brethren, I would that ye should humble yourselves before God and bring forth fruit, meat for repentance, that ye may also enter into that rest. And so, I wonder if if maybe that's it. It's it's the rest of the rest being the remainder of of the Lord. Well, and I'm just going to share some uh, some scriptures here in the in the comments. I hope they posted. Maybe they did not. They did. Okay, great. Um, here are some. You just read 13, was it? Uh, 13, 13. Yeah. So, yeah, if we look in, in chapter 13, if uh, verse 6, and thus being called by this holy calling and ordained unto the high priesthood of the holy order of God to teach his commandments unto the children of men that they might also enter into his rest. And so what we're what we're seeing here are, um, characteristics of people who enter into the rest of the Lord. So in verse six, um, called to do so, ordained by the priesthood, the holy order of God, uh, teach commandments to others. And then verses 12 and 13, now they, after being sanctified by the Holy Ghost, having their garments made white, being pure and spotless before God, could not look upon sin, save it were with abhorrence. And there were many, exceedingly great many, who were made pure, and entered into the rest of the Lord their God. And now, my brethren, I would that ye should humble yourselves before God and bring forth fruit, meat for repentance, that ye may also enter into that rest. And then verse 16. Now these ordinances were given after this manner, that thereby the people might look forward on the Son of God, it being a type of his order, or it being his order, and this, that they might look forward to him for a remission of their sins, that they might enter into the rest of the Lord. And then, and then verse 29, having faith on the Lord, having a hope that ye shall receive eternal life, having the love of God always in your hearts, that ye may be lifted up at the last day and enter into his rest. So I think those are good, um, those are good points uh, and good verses to point to, um, to things we ought to be doing. Uh, maybe the, the work that we may that, that we should be doing to get to that point of, of being um, uh, in the rest of the Lord. So um, should we read a few? Yeah, let's read another couple of comments here. Ben, rest of the Lord, a phrase commonly used in the Old Testament stories signifying the end of their journey. Ah, yeah, a peaceful place of bounty and happiness. This is a common theme found in the Exodus legends, the conquest of Canaan, and the return from Babylon, even the temple ceremony in old times, where a priest wearing, a spe wearing special robes would pass through a veil and enter into Yahweh's presence, was a reminder that this life was temporary and the goal was to get closer to the source of all holiness. So given that our scriptures are based on that Hebrew tradition, it's likely that they're using the same terminology and referencing the same ideas. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Ben. And I think that it's interesting, too, that, um, you know, when we think of rest often, um, I mean, the Sabbath day in general, right? Over the past several years, there's been a, if not an emphasis, certainly a highlight on the importance of of keeping the Sabbath day separate, holy, of um, of having it be an actual day of of rest and um and I think that that doing these things even and, and those acts of faithfulness um, can really contribute to that, to that rest. Um, Brenda, let's see, you can find rest in working for the Savior and in sharing his gospel. Example, I can work hard at sewing, but if I'm in an uncomfortable position, I simply feel tired. If, however, I have the support of a comfortable chair, I can get more done and feel rested and accomplished at the end. If I try to do good things, I can accomplish good things. But if I rely on the Lord to be my support and help me do good things, then I can find rest in his arms, having accomplished his work. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any, anything else? Anybody? Boys? Anyone? No, that's I, good. Okay. I had a good rest last night, if that, if that counts for anything. so I think it does. Yeah. 
Well, it's important too because you know rest is actually something that um, I we've we read a lot of studies about how um, in general so many in society are 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 kind of chronically sleep deprived and how that's actually part of health. Mm -hmm. that that nutrition is part of health that exercise and work and engagement but also proper rest and i think that applies to spiritual health as well resting in the lord no i i agree with you and and if you think about it as well i don't know if we can really be utilized to our fullest potential if we want to go back to comparing rest with the body if we can really get to our fullest potential to to be to be spiritually uh active and 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 using it as much as we can if we're not resting in the lord the way that it's supposed to be and so it, it's almost like that rest needs to happen so that we could utilize what we have to our fullest and i think that's an important thing to, to keep in mind as we're doing this and 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 you know as brenda had mentioned you can find rest in working for the savior i know people who have found their rest in in partaking of the sacrament and going to the temple uh meditating things like that that can help us to get the rest that we need to to have our our bodies and spirits be ready for the work that needs to be done absolutely there yeah that renewal that comes from rest thank you grant absolutely um so <clears throat> basically chapter 13 is alma and amulek teaching the people right and then we get to chapter 14 and then what happens you want to give a summary a lot of people said yay and more people said no yeah the majority said absolutely not right so they're imprisoned as it talks about here in smitten and this is where i think one of the biggest atrocities happens in the book of mormon agreed it's it's a rough it's a rough thing to read about for sure and to understand you know as you read through this and uh, amulek saying hey, we have the power to stop this. Should we stop this? And Alma says, no, it, it needs to happen so that uh, basically the Lord has the ability to do what he's going to do later to this land of Ammonihah. And we learn within four months of Alma and Amulek actually leaving, that's when the Lamanites actually turn to Ammonihah and just bury it to the ground. They kill everyone. But anyway, that's so, a little bit later. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, Let's let's head back here at the beginning of, of 14. Yes. And it, it says right here. And it came to pass after he had made an end of speaking unto the people. Many of them did believe on his words and began to repent and to search the scriptures. Um, and the, the more part of them were desirous that they might destroy Alma and Amulek, for they were angry with Alma because of the plainness of his words unto Zezra. And they also said that Amulek had lied unto them and had reviled against their law and also against their lawyers and judges. And so um not only were they angry, they were accusing the Alma and Amulek of breaking the law. And rather than just kind of say, all right, you've broken the law, off, off you go um, to jail, they made a huge show of it. They brought, brought them before the chief judge. And um, what's interesting is that in verse six, what we see is, and it came to pass that Zeezrom was astonished at the words which had been spoken, but he also knew concerning the blindness of the minds, which he had caused among the people by his lying words. And his soul began to be harrowed up under a consciousness of his own guilt. Yea, he began to be encircled about by the pains of hell. And it came to pass that he began to cry unto the people saying, behold, I am guilty and these men are spotless before God. And he began to plead for them from that time forth, but they reviled him saying, are you also crazy? Art thou also possessed with the devil? And they spit upon him and cast him out from among them. And also all those who believed in the words which had been spoken by Alma and Amulek and cast them out and sent men to cast stones at them. And then this is the part that is um, just atrocious before we get there can i make yes. one comment yeah. so alma the younger we know the the situation that he went through when he was first visited by the angel it kind of mirrors a lot of the things that we'll see happen with zezrum right literally their physical bodies as you guys talked about rest just a few minutes ago that's what came to my mind because both of their physical bodies failed them they um actually had issues where they literally had to stop and they had to 
um, go into almost a coma-like or a trance-like state to have certain things done. So I think that's important to recognize. Also, the stature that both of these men gave up to recognize the principles of the gospel, to do the things that they knew in their hearts that they should do, I think is outstanding. Alma, of course, was the chief judge over all the land. And we'll start seeing the chief judge of just this province or of Ammonihah. We'll start to see him doing some majorly bad things, literally striking, smiting, um, spitting upon Alma and Amulek as they are in the as they are in the prison a little bit later in the chapter. Um, so he gave up basically what would have been a very high prestige position to basically go out and, and share the gospel with others. We also notice though that Zeezrom, he was touted in last week's uh, lesson and earlier chapters as being one of the most skilled lawyers one of the people who knew how to really utilize words and he was very loquacious. Well, he's, uh, you know, haired up by um, a memory of all his guilt and all the things that he has done wrong. So, you know, some interesting things here as we start to see these parallels start to occur. Yeah. And, and one thing that stands out to me as well, <clears throat> and I don't, I don't mean to glorify in, in some of the brutality of this, but I think it's important to, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it's important to point out what goes on here because the way that it's written I think sometimes we might gloss over it, but the way that I'm reading verse seven, um, about halfway through, they cast out um, they cast out all those who believed in the words which had been spoken by Alma and Amulek, and then they had people throw stones at them, and then verse eight is is almost worse. So not only did they cast the men out in verse eight, and they brought their wives and children together, and whosoever believed or had been taught to believe in the word of God, they caused should be cast into the fire, and then in verse nine. Uh, um, Alma and Amulek were basically brought to watch this whole thing. And when, and then in verse 10, and when Amulek saw the pains of the women and children who were consuming the fire, he was also pained. And he said to Alma, how can we witness this awful scene? Therefore, let us stretch forth our hands and exercise the powers of God, which is in us and save them from the flames. And the reason why I bring all this up is, is, is twofold. Number one, we've talked for a long time. The Book of Mormon would be a fascinating movie. I wish someone would try and do the Book of Mormon movie and do it justice, but you almost can't because it'll be an R-rated, a hard R-rated movie because of scenes like this. But number two, when you witness what was going on, the men are cast out. The women and children are brought together. I don't know if the men knew it was going to happen or not. The women and children are brought together and then they're thrown into a pit of fire and, and again, not to get too gross, but we know what happens to the human body when you are burned, when something like that happens. It's not instantaneous. And Alma and Amulek have to listen to the cries of women and children. And that's where Am Amulek says, we've got to do something. We have all this power. We've got to do something. And Alma has to say in verse 11, the spirit constraineth me that I must not stretch forth mine hand for behold, the Lord receiveth them up unto himself in glory. And he doth suffer that they may do this thing or that the people may do this thing unto them according to the hardness of their hearts a little bit further down. And the blood of the innocents shall stand as a witness against them and yea, cry mightily against them in that last day. So it sound if, if without a close reading, it almost sounds like Alma saying, uh, uh, you know what? Sorry, God's saying no. But I wonder if a closer looking at that is almost Alma having this same pain to say, I can't do anything. This needs to happen. God is going to receive them up in glory, but their innocent blood that was shed is going to be a witness against these awful people on that day. And that's got to be hard for two people who have the power of God to, as, as we're going to see later, break down prison walls, and yet they have to witness the suffering of these of these women and children as they're cast into this into this pit of fire. I thank you, Brant. I would say that I don't. I, I doubt Alma said, you know, ah, oh, well, this has because it says right in. Um, in, in verse 11, Alma said unto him, the spirit constraineth me that I must not. Um, and, and I think that's a key, that's a key part of it. And I, and I need to say too, I think I would be remiss if I didn't. Uh, Why should we listen to me? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, it says in verse 10, that Almulek when he saw the pains of the women and children, he was pained and he said, how can we witness this awful scene? And so I think, you know, I think all of us 
um, right now can relate to that um, with everything that that's uh, going on right now, especially in in this country. Um, and to that, I want to turn to this from President Spencer W. Kimball as he talked about what are what are we watching here? This is just showing the scene. Oh, okay. It's Book of Mormon stories, yeah. So if you have the Book of Mormon videos, if you watch those on YouTube, this will show the scene with Alan Amulek, but obviously not as gruesome as yeah. it probably happened, but yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to share this again from President Spencer W. Kimball, and, and I, I just want to preface this by saying maybe this will maybe this will bring comfort to someone. May, and if, if not, at least for me, when I read this, this has given me a lot to think about. President Spencer W. Kimball once commented on the many seemingly inexplicable tragedies that happen in the world. Could the Lord have prevented these tragedies? The answer is yes. The Lord is omnipotent with all power to control our lives, save us pain, prevent all accidents, even prevent us from death, protect us, I'm sorry, from death, if he will but he will not. If all the sick for whom we pray were healed, if all the righteous were protected and the wicked destroyed, the whole program of the Father would be annulled and the basic principle of the gospel, free agency, would be ended. No man would have to live by faith. If we were to close the doors upon sorrow and distress, we might be excluding our greatest friends and benefactors. Suffering can make saints of people as they learn patience, long suffering, and self-mastery. I am grateful that even through the priesthood, I cannot heal all the sick. I might heal people who should die. I might relieve people of suffering who should suffer. I fear I would frustrate the purposes of God. Had I limitless power and yet limited vision and understanding, I might have saved Abinadi from the flames of fire when he was burned at the stake. And in so doing, I, or I'm sorry, in doing so, I might have irreparably damaged him. He died a martyr and went to a martyr's reward, exaltation. I would likely have protected Paul against his woes if my power were boundless. I would surely have healed his thorn in the flesh. And in so doing, I might have foiled the Lord's program. I fear that had I been in Carthage jail on June 27th, 1844, I might have deflected the bullets that pierced the body of the prophet Joseph Smith and the patriarch Hiram Smith. I might have saved them from the sufferings and agony but lost them to the martyr's death and reward. With such uncontrolled power, I surely would have felt to protect Christ from the agony in Gethsemane, the insults, the thorny crown, the indignities in the court, the physical injuries. I would have administered to his wounds and healed them, giving him cooling water instead of vinegar. I might have saved him from suffering and death and lost to the world his atoning sacrifice. In the face of apparent tragedy, we must put our trust in God, knowing that despite our limited view, his purposes will not fail. Now, I'll be honest, Brant and John and everyone. <laughs> when I read this, I was torn. And that's why I come away from it with, at, you know, in the very last sentence, despite our limited view, because I, I admit fully my... Um, my mortality and not understanding. Um, I don't understand why why people have to suffer for for a greater purpose. I don't get it, and I don't, you know, I I don't get it. Um, I don't understand why then. I don't understand why now. And um, but I just wanted to share that. Uh, that quote from President Kimball in case any of that gave, gives anyone here, again, either some comfort or um, or something at least to think about. Two, two quick thoughts, Jenny. Um, I really appreciate what Lisa Reed said. She said, that part in the Book of Mormon was so hard for my kids to read, to explain to them that mothers and children were burned and were the ones that believed the whole bad things happen to good people discussion. And I think that that's such a hard part of our, of our reality, that sometimes bad things happen to good people. And I'm glad that it was addressed in the Come Follow Me manual. Sometimes God allows the righteous to suffer, and we don't have good answers for that. One of the, the scriptures that's always gotten me through it, and I've, I've talked about it before in the past, is uh, 
is in first Nephi when Nephi is seeing the angel and he's witnessing all the things that his father witnessed. And in verse 16, in first Nephi eleven sixteen, and he said unto me, knowest thou the condescension of God and set first Nephi eleven seventeen is the scripture that's always stuck with me. And I said unto him, I know that he loveth his children. Nevertheless, I do not know the meaning of all things. And that's the thing that's had to stick with me through so many awful things. Um, we're probably going to talk about it on our news re- on our news review show this next week. Uh, but I've been reading a lot of the legal documents, but about the 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 death of the two Daybell children and and finding the children on the on the property of Chad Daybell. It's been a hard weekend having to read all that stuff, and especially some of the things that were involved with it. And it's times like that where I say. I know God loves his children, but I don't know the meaning of all things. And, and sometimes that's all we have to get through. And, and it's not an easy answer. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't answer it 100%. But sometimes, Jenny, there's times in my life where I just have to cling to that one scripture to get me through. Thank you very much, Brent. I, I like that a lot. And that's a good reminder. I think I'm actually going to, I'm going to make note of that later because I, that, that's a good reminder. I, I feel like if what you know is that God, that our heavenly parents love their children and that we don't know all things, but also, you know, put into place um, that working righteousness. You know, I, I think it's notable that when Alma and Ann Milek witnessed that horrific scene, they both wanted to act. And I think that that's, um, you know, we, we want to act, we want to help, we want to work righteousness and we want to, um, we want to relieve others suffering. And I, I feel like that's something that, um, I mean, is there anything that's more attributable to the savior than, than wanting to relieve others suffering? Of course, we can't do it in the manner that, that only the savior can, but I, I feel like that is a way that, um, that desire, that urge to help others is a way to work righteousness. And, and as cynical as I can be sometimes, I think that that's the one thing that brings me back to on the whole, I think people are, are naturally good people because how many times have we heard when someone is going through a difficult time, how many times have we heard from another person, I wish I could take this away from you. I mean, how, how much of that is just inherent in our bodies and in our, in our entire souls. And yet that's, that's almost an archetype of what Christ did. I want to take that away, but I can't, whether it's, 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 and I'm thinking of situations in my life of, of a child passing, not one of my children directly, but a close friend having that happen, or, or someone who is who's going through a, a physical hard time, someone who's going through some things mentally or emotionally, and you just want to say, I want to take that from you, and you can't, and that's the yeah. hardest part of this whole thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, Bessie shares, suffering certainly turns me to a full dependence upon the Lord, it tends to humble my prideful self. I think we can all relate to that. Thank you. Um, and then, let's see. I'm going to do... Michael Bishop. Yeah. Uh, I feel like my kids are so innocent. And when we read something so horrific like this, their minds can't even imagine what is actually going on in the scripture stories. I know someday we won't be able to protect them from sadness and trials, but I'm grateful that they are so sweet. Absolutely. I've, I've actually said those words to... My kids that you just said, Brent, I, I've said to them, you know, in tears, I wish I could take away your pain. I, I don't know why it's happening. And, and you know, just to piggyback off of what Michael said, um, you know, I, I kind of go through two modes with my kids because my, my six-year-old, she loves, do you remember the old 1970s? It was put out by the church, but like the, the cartoon version of the Book of Mormon. Do you remember that one, Jenny? I don't know. Is it the, like the film strip? It's not the film strip, but it's it's a it's a book. Uh, and, oh, the and, book. Yeah, the Illustrated Book of Mormon. I think that's like the big ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were different colors. And the thing that stands out is is like the Lamanites and the Nephites. They all had really odd looking weapons, like something futuristic and sci fi, almost like the the swords with all these. Anyways, anyways, that's the one I'm talking about. So my six year old loves that. She loves to read it, and I think for her, it's it's written very simply. And it gives a, a picture so she can have some context of what she's looking at. And, and to go with what Michael was saying, I think that's the thing about getting older. And sometimes that's what makes it more difficult. When you're young, you really can't 
contextualize what you're you're reading and and you only have simplistic views of, of what you're looking at but as you get older i think that's when it starts to hit you a little bit more in the chest it to sit there and think through visually think through what is going on here because we have so much more life experience and also uh, uh, so much more visuals uh, good or bad to know what that actually looks like and that's the hardest part and then to to do what he's talking about to to look at innocent children and and realize they they don't understand how horrific this is um but he's right and and granted jenny your kids are, are older than my kids i just have a little six-year-old and it breaks my heart when she has a back when she was actually going to school when she would have a hard day at school and she would tell me about a mean kid i get into dad mode where it's like you know what bring him on i don't care if he's six years old i'll take care of this uh, you know here i a 36 year old wanting to get in the face of a six-year-old um but i think that's the thing it's it's it can be heartbreaking to know that you can't protect them and and almost even sadder sometimes they have to go through those hard things because they've got to learn something about themselves and and i know jenny with with your kids that are older they've experienced a lot more than mine that's got to be the hard thing to sit back sometimes and say i want to fix this and and i i can fully you know i, I can give you all the feels in the world but sometimes you need to go through things like heartbreak that it, it really stinks to go through it but that's that's part of being human and and i'll tell you you know there are things like that like hard heartbreak and and hard days and things but then it gets to a point too where your kids go through, through things that you've never had to go through and that that can be you know a chance for not only them but for you as a parent to to rely on the savior mm -hmm. because he knows what that's like too mm -hmm. so We've got just a, a few minutes left and um, I just want to, I, I don't want to, um, <clears throat> I don't want to omit uh, chapter 15 um, talks about discipleship um, requiring sacrifice in a lot of ways. And then in chapter 16, um, you know, the, 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 the words of the prophets being fulfilled. Um, in just the last couple of minutes that we have, do either of you want to say anything about either of those two subjects or, I mean, I think we've, we've had some really good discussions. It's just that we're out of time. <laughs> yeah. Let me defer to John. I've got something completely separate that I want to bring up. So let me defer to John on this one. Well, I, I'll just, I'll just bring up one thing, you know, we'll let um, what you guys discuss go away here soon, but Liberty jail, you know, as we talk about suffering and, the desire to have something taken from you. I mean, you know, there's a reason why, um, you know, Elder Holland called Liberty Day Jail a, a temple, right? It, it's where this revelation, section 121 was received, but I, I liken this a lot to what happens to Alma and Amulek in the prison, you know, as they're being smitten by the high priest and all the people, and then they finally obviously get out, they break their, their bands, the earthquake happens, they're the two that are left alive. But we ask these questions, God, where art thou? Where's the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? You know, how long shall thy hand be stayed? Um, how, how long, you know, do we have to endure these things? And so I think we all go through this as we see again in uh, these chapters in Alma that everyone must experience this. And to your point, Brant, I believe that's 100% true. The Lord is saying, these these are things that sorry i might have been lost there for a minute these are things that need to happen um so that you can figure some things out about yourself you know as you become more introspective and you realize on on who you rely for your strength obviously the lord um these are things that we must go through to understand things about ourselves and become the type of person that our heavenly father wants us to become Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as, as we wrap up, Jenny, if, if you don't mind, can I just give a little teaser for, for next week? Sure. Because we're going to talk about the sons of Mosiah next week and, and their mission. And, and do you know, do you know the, the verses of or the scriptures of Alma that we're going to be talking about at 17 through something? Yeah, it'll be Alma chapters 17 through 22. The name of the lesson is I will make an instrument of thee. And just um, for those who are going to be joining us and, and setting this those chapters this week. Um, what the manual suggests is um, at, to ask you 
If you've ever wished you could be better at sharing the gospel. That being said, Brant, what do you have to say about these about these yeah. uh, chapters coming up? We're going to be talking a lot about that. And and I think we're going to have some interesting discussions on on missions in general, something that I'm passionate about as a as a return missionary. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting to compare and contrast the mission of the sons of Mosiah and the mission of Alma. And I mentioned this at the beginning of our um at the beginning of our show, we're going to see some parallel narratives going on here. And I just wanted to reference uh, a book called Understanding the Book of Mormon, A Reader's Guide by Grant Hardy. And I might've just lost my page. So give me just a second as I stall to find it. Okay. So let me just, let me just read this. Finally, although both Alma and the sons of Mosiah are described as operating by the spirit of revelation and prophecy, what this means is their day-to-day -day affairs vary significantly. According to details provided by Mormon, Alma preaches from professional experience and confidence as the former chief judge who retains his current position as high priest of the church. His plan is to quote, pull down all the pride and craftiness of his people by quote, bearing down in pure testimony against them. As he speaks from a privileged position to those under his authority, it is only when he gets to Ammonihah, which is where the people in question, the people question his jurisdiction over them that he runs into trouble in general, his sermon, Well, what it says about the sons of Mosiah. The sons of Mosiah, on the other hand, are enthusiastic but nervous about their missions. They are going among their longtime enemies. And at the end of the day, they seem to experience a little more success than Alma. So something interesting to think about. Compare and contrast what Alma went through this in this week's lesson and what the sons of Mosiah are going to go through next week. And let's talk about that next week. Absolutely. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. Okay, everyone, thank you so much. We got we had so many wonderful comments. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them um, this week, but thank you for being here and thank you for sharing. Again, please join us next week at 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, 12 noon Eastern, and all the times in between. Um, again, next week's lesson, Alma, chapters 17 through 22, and next week's lesson will be um, on a week from today, Sunday, June 28th. Thank you, John Dye, for doing all the behind the scenes and in front of the scenes things. Thank you, Brant Malone, for joining me. And uh, thanks, everyone. Please let us know what we can do for you. And uh, look out for us this week with our Mormon News Report weekly episode. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone.